All right, guys, welcome to an episode I really didn't want to shoot, but I had to. Um, I've got an international crowd, um, and including some people who think, yeah, if you eat Dutch, you eat much, say hi to my squirrel friend there. Um, yeah, so there's a place called Holland, the Netherlands. It's in some area. I just know that there's windmills and tulips some part of the year and that the people are hard to deal with but one redeeming thing about them if there's nothing besides windmills and tulips is that they built guitars that are kind of the equivalent of just an up tick from our harmonies and k's in the united states and they were called eggmans <laughs> Now, I have one here, and it is tore up from the floor up. It's got a couple things that are stopping it from being a great guitar in the middle. And the first thing is it is a flat top, and you know that any of you loyal viewers know that that is a cardinal sin of this channel. It's a flat top. Do you see any F holes? No, you don't. I can't even believe what luck this guitar has had number one to find the likes of me and number two to actually be featured on my channel so there's an issue here there's a bad issue here and i'm going to show it to you right now the action on this guitar is stupid high do you see that right there let me flip it around for you you see that right there? How high can an action be, right? So, what we are gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about Eggman guitars, um, their history and stuff, and we're gonna look at where I got this guitar, how it came to me. Um, it actually came from, I think, London or someplace like that. And it came all the way over here to act non-stop action acton california acton california that's right cultural capital and while you're sitting there i see you yeah i got my money's worth on the weed eater accident <laughs> okay moving right along let's take a look at where i got this and let's take a look at what it sounded like when i got it and then we'll get to work so this is a 1960s Eggman. Um, Ken had told me that he was looking for one, and uh, they were only made in Netherlands. So decided to do a little bit of looking, and it turned out that uh, finding one here in the States is very difficult and hard to get them to you. Um, but we had some parameters. It had to be in very rough condition, which, uh, as you can see, this one's pretty beat up. Uh, but we found this one in the UK, and. Uh, Got it at a great price and had it shipped over. Amazingly, it showed up in just a few days. And um, as rough as it does look, it actually sounds really good. What do you think? I can't do it much justice, but. people me and my squirrel friend we figured out what to do with this guitar and we fixed the action you're not gonna beat me look at this look at that you can't even get a quarter underneath there now which means that saddle can be filed down a little bit or whatever I want to do but there it is that is the master breed that is the luthierousness of me, the fake luthier, here at Paul Miro Junk Pow Guitars. So, maybe I should show you how I did this. I don't think I should, but you know what? 
Something's telling me that I probably have to. Let's, <laughs> let's go to the bench. This is so sad. Okay, guys, listen up. It is confession time for me because, um, well, maybe that airplane will drown out some of the more painful parts of my confession, but um, I've got some string stuff to put back on here. I think that there are plenty of people out there who would say, oh, no, Ken is admitting to the fact that he may, may have made a mistake. I'm going to put a string back on here so I can show you what I'm up to here because, yeah, you're going to be shocked about this and you're going to be looking to find one of these guitars. There we go. Okay, so there's a part I didn't tell you about, okay? So you can see right there how high that action is. And the part I didn't tell you about is right here. You see this plug right here? There is a screw right there. Now, if I put this screwdriver in here and I turn this, let me see here, this way, I can actually make that neck move very easily and correct that action and get it where a dime can fit under it. Let me see if I can do this now. Get this where you can see what's happening. Now, does this make me a liar? Well, not so much, maybe a little bit. But you can see that that action just went from big enough to put my middle finger on underneath the string to that. So these Eggmans are a pretty good deal. There's the, there's the label. Okay, you see that? I'm still trying to adjust the camera. But there's Soviet Union guitars that do the same thing. So if you see something that looks like somebody put a screw in the neck, but it looks like a cap, well, it may just be one of these guitars that has a neck adjustment. So I've got a lot of time on my hands now. And so I'm going to put myself to work showing you just how quickly this will clean up. So I think there was some clickbait in the neck action cleanup. So I didn't actually flat out lie to you, but let me get the strings off of this and I'm going to show you a couple tricks. And I think the before and after on this guitar is going to shock you. Okay, the first thing I'm going to tell you is this guitar was never meant to have metal strings on it, steel strings. So we're going to cut those off. And when you go to putting steel strings on something, you have to ask yourself, do you see bridge pins here? No. Um, do they make nylon strings that have little keepers at the end so you don't know how to have to know how to tie the knot in a nylon strings of course they do ernie ball makes some i think they have a silver and black like most of the nylon string types do but this was never meant to have steel strings so when we look at the back of the arch the bridge is picking up a little bit that's probably why so that's the first thing we need to think about is why are we putting steel strings on a guitar that was never meant for it and then wondering why the action might give up the ghost whether or not isn't that an odd saying give up the ghost okay so the first thing i'm going to do is tell you that i can vacuum out the inside and i can take a little piece of matchbook or something and make sure that this label in here is good i do want to get uh, a shot later and kind of show you what that neck adjustment thing looks like from the inside but the first thing i'm going to do is take some naphtha and clean off 
the top of the guitar. Now, naphtha is not available in California as naphtha per se, okay? And, um, and the reason why is because walking out to your post office mailbox in California requires you to have a cancer label warning on you. Now this stuff isn't good to be dumping all over the place uncontrolled, but as any of these things I'm gonna to talk to you about today, when you're using this stuff, see the dirt that's coming up there? A squeak coming out of the wood, squeak like a mouse squeaks, is gonna be a good thing to tell you that you're making progress. The idea about this guitar is I'm not going to refinish it. I'm not going to do anything with it, but I am actually going to French polish whatever comes up the way it is at the end. And whatever scars, scratches, whatever this thing has is going to be embedded into my finish. I picked up a nice little file down in here at a show that will get down in here for me but look at all that okay that's step one put some naphtha on the thing okay doesn't hurt to go over his fingerboard we're going to do a little bit of that with another technique here in a minute okay so the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to use this stuff i call fred's magic it's a three-part solution you can tell that there's some kind of oil or something in here. If you beg me, I still won't tell you exactly what's in here, but what this does is it's the best cleaner I have ever seen. So we've taken fingerprints and who knows what, and I just put a little bit of it on some paper towel, and we're just going to put this on here like so. And again, there's some oil in it, so you're going to be able to hear that squeak at one point. It's not going to damage the finish or anything like that, but it is certainly going to pick up dirt that the naphtha even wouldn't pick up. So it's kind of like, you hear that squeaking? That is a good thing. So I'm going to take this everywhere and it's got a residual it gives you a shine but the thing about this is we're going to try to and again this is kind of like a soap it works on anything that has wood consistency to it there we go now we're just going to flip that over and just wipe this off like so now it's going to be a little bit damp that's not going to matter but look at all that dirt now check this out. You see there's a number on the back of this. It says a thousand. I'm batting a thousand now, right? Okay, so I've got a piece of fretboard cut off here and I'm just putting this in, believe this or not, I'm gonna take this thousand grit and I'm gonna go over the whole top of the guitar. I like having this block. Oh look, I'm even going over this part here. I want to be real careful here. What we are doing is we are just taking off a little tiny bit of the finish here. And when we're doing that, you can tell by seeing the dirt being raised out of the grain here. Like so, so you're just gonna go over all of this like so. I don't like going against the grain with this. So get in as close as you can, but go over the whole surface of the guitar. Keep it wet. And you can see that the water is trying to beat up and you can see that there's filth and crud coming up in here. But again, this is a thousand grit sandpaper. 
and just watch it real carefully. If you go over headstock logos with this kind of stuff, you're gonna see that if the headstock logo is supposed to be white and it's kind of gray or got some black marks on it, you will be able to tell that this stuff is working. Do not start off with 80 grit or 100 or 200 or any of that. You can use a thousand or more. And um, let's take a look at what this just did, what just come up off of this. Look at that. We use naphtha. We use the secret sauce cleaner, Fred's secret sauce. And then we did this light sanding with thousand grit paper. And look at that. You would never guess all that is hiding there. Okay, now before we do the next part, there's some spirit finish involved in this next part. So I want to go over this and you hear that squeaking. I want to hear that because it tells me that the wood is going to be ready to accept what's going on. While I'm doing this part, I'm kind of feeling, you know, is there bumps and raises and splits and cracks and all that? Yeah, there's a little bit right here where this has been pulled up again from somebody using the wrong strings and tightening it up too much. And I'll tell you, if it wasn't for that attachment or that, that um, neck adjustment system, we would be in trouble but the whole thing is I want as much of the moisture off of this as possible because again look at this look at the dirt so now I'm going to fold up something and I am going to French polish this guitar again the way it is so I'm going to take some lac pad finish and I'm not going to give away all my trade secrets but I just dribble that on here like this and the trick to French polishing is the stuff is going to stick to itself. And so if you're going back and forth and whatever, you really don't want to do that. You just want to put it on. So I'm actually building a base coat that will help the French polish process later. So I'm just going to take some of this and I'm just wiping on a layer like that. And I don't want to stop. I just want to go down. I want to start at the edge of the guitar and move to a stopping point and then pick up. I don't swirl this. I'm just like so. And then I keep doing this until I've got a good preliminary coat on the guitar. And I'm going to do this twice and I'll be able to tell how it's going to work by feeling the top of it and again I don't want you'll be able to feel the rag sticking when it goes over where you've been before but we're going to get a good couple of coats on this. This stuff will dry where you can put a couple coats on a day, but don't use too much and let it dry thoroughly. Again, this is lac pad finish. Okay, so everything is thoroughly dry on that first coat of lac pad finish. And I am just going to go put another one on like so. Again, I don't stop. I don't swirl. I just like so. Now, if you've done any kind of touch up with paint or anything like that on your guitar and it's water soluble, putting this coat of lac pad polish on before you start French polishing a couple days before is a great idea. Again, one more time, the trick to this is don't plop down. Wherever you plop down and you've got lac pad finish, you're going to see marks. You Don't touch it with your fingers. Um, you're going to notice I put rubber gloves on when I start doing the polishing. But the technique is start off the guitar and go straight and pull off at the end. Don't stop in the middle and pick up or sit down in the middle. 
to start your motion or to end it. Okay, fast forward. Our base layer of lac finish is on, everything is good. So now what we're doing is, I've got this little Vicks bottle and inside is a lac polishing pad. And I've got some excess lac polish finish in there. And what this is, is cotton, wool, and then fine linen over the top. And what ends up happening is this soaks up the finish. And you see how my glove is turning shiny? This is wet, so it's got lacquer on it. And then what I do is I take some Everclear. This is all spirit-based varnish. And I squeeze a couple drops of Everclear on there. Now, people will tell you that this stuff will try to start to stick to itself. So maybe you use olive oil or mineral oil or something like that. I don't like using those kinds of oils because I don't want something, especially on a junky guitar like this, to get under the finish and bubble up later. So if you have one of these jars when you're done using your lac pad, as long as you don't let it hit the fret sides or get on any metal stuff, these things will last quite a while. But it's important, again, that they are cotton, wool, and then a fine piece of linen, okay? Now you recharge this by slapping it against here. Pay attention to this part here. I'm gonna always come in off of the surface and move away, I never drop down. So we're gonna start by doing this section up here. We're gonna come on and we are just gonna work circles and we're gonna keep moving like so. And you can feel it pull once it hits where you have been, okay? Use some things on the guitar sections. Um, when I'm working an arch top, I'll use F holes, but I'm gonna come off like that. And I'm gonna recharge it by slapping it on my hand. I'm gonna look where I've been and I'm gonna come off of the edge and I'm just gonna continue to do circles and work an area keeping a wet edge. If you feel it pulling, it's telling you you've been there already. Again, you keep getting dirt coming up off of this thing. Can you see that? Now, if this starts to dry out, again, I'm coming in off the edge like this. I've been right there. And you can do three or four coats of this a day, but it's really important that you leave this dry and then come off the edge like that, okay? It is literally going to take you, you might put 20 coats of this stuff on the guitar by doing this. But the more you do it, especially if you leave time in between, it builds upon itself, it sinks in, and it creates a marvelous this is how they used to do the old violins, again, off the edge. I'm gonna leave this alone now until it dries out. I'm gonna do the same thing that I've done to the top on all of the, the guitar, and um, you'll see how it turns out. Let's talk about the neck a little bit. Oh, before I forget housekeeping, make sure there's a little bit of lac finish sitting down in the jar that you keep your French polish pad in because it will stay charged up and again every time you pull it out to use it you're going to use a couple drops of Everclear that all works together to keep everything spiriting off and um, layer after layer. Oh I want to make sure I showed you I'm not going to do it now but if I want to get the dust and um, the gunk out of uh, the saddle slot or, or this part right here. I've got this nice little file. It looks like a piece of metal for a shim for kind of like an arbor press, but it has teeth, file teeth of one 
a grade here and another one's coarser and one's finer and that fits right down in here and this works good we're not going to do that now but let's i love this workstation we'll move this down a little bit till the end and I want to show you I have a luthier magnet here I'm going to stay away from this area and make sure it's dried out but I'm going to take some zero 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 or four aught steel wool and I'm going to pull it here and I am just going to basically with this thing nice and firm I am going to go along and work over the frets like so now you want to remember that when you're working with steel wool it's going to want to hang out and it's going to live on forever but if you've got this luthier magnet right here and you go along like this you're going to pick up all those fragments there and you won't have to worry about it but take some time while you're doing the rest of your work and just go over and get these frets and everything next to the frets use this really fine steel wool to make that look good like so again guys when you are working over your fretboard with steel wool do not forget to go over the body and the whole fretboard with your luthier magnet now your luthier magnet is very strong so it'll want to clack into your frets especially with this these old brass cheaper frets but look at that right there you see all that yeah you don't want that floating around your guitar back to this part weight two or three coats a day is going to pay off for you in the end don't get anxious guys before we get too far into this i promised you i would show you what that adjustable setup for the neck looks like from inside the guitar it's just threaded kind of like a t-knot that is stabilized and the neck moves up and down in a joint that's tapered that's what it looks like okay guys we're going to be starting on the headstock and i want to tell you what i use to do these tuners uh, is mineral oil food grade mineral oil so i just take a q-tip and put a little bit on there and just go along and touch up all the gears where everything comes together the metal and stuff like so i don't goop it all over there and get it all over but that's how it works now if i happen to have one of these uh, that is bent one of these tuner pegs is bent i'll heat it up with a soldering iron and then very carefully take and bend it back into shape but if any of these aren't working right the best thing to do is a little mineral oil will fix that up for you once i get everything done i'm going to pull these off and then i'm going to do the headstock up here the same way i did this soundboard or top of the guitar uh down a ways i am going to use naphtha i'm going to use a cleaner and then i'm going to use a thousand grit sandpaper and then I'm going to French polish it just like it is. And of course, I'm going to junk pile it up. I'll have an Eli Green bead up here and, and something up here to tell you I was here. But same process everywhere. Okay, I will tell you this. If you have tuners that are hung up or um, sticking, once you get that mineral oil on there, if you take your winder and just nice and slow get them rolling, until they loosen up now is the time to do that and then of course once that's all done on both sides we can pull the tuners and mark them you can tell if the tuners are upside down or whatever after you get them off there you want to make sure that you use the right size not too big not too small on these 
uh, slotted screws because you're going to want to put them back in if they're original. And if you need to clean stuff up, a little bit of that mineral oil and a Q-tip is going to give you what you need. We have completed our French polishing ad nauseum. There's coats of it on the soundboard, sides, back, uh, headstock, neck, everywhere. So now what we're going to do is we're going to buff this out. And we're going to use some scratch axe. And I've got this little sponge pad here. So you don't need too much of this. You're going to squirt this on here like so. And then move it around where it's not too thick. And then we're going to go to a spot here. And that loud truck is going to go by. And we are just going to go over. Now I can feel the rough spots on this finish. I could have taken some naphtha and some sandpaper but that's okay we're just going to go along here like so and cover that whole top now we're not going to let this soak in and dry very long we're just going to get the wet part of it off and go everywhere here and then the next part of it is pretty important we're going to use something called a wipe all 80 it's a rag that is made out of paper I learned about these from Ken Parker paper lintless they're easy to cut cut a piece like this again WYPA L L. Do the texture of that. I'm just going to fold this up like so, and we're just going to go along, and we are going to buff this until we hear that squeak. And guys, you are not going to believe what this looks like in comparison to where we started. So, you're going to hear this, oh, hear that squeaking. Don't be afraid of it. But this is actually polishing off the finish to make it level again. Most of the dirt is gone, which is good. We want that. And you're just going to keep doing this until you hear that squeak. And I don't know if you can see this, but in comparison to what this thing started off with, not only did we not have to do a neck reset on the thing, but the top of this soundboard is turning out pretty nice. It, it still qualifies as a junk pile, that's for sure, but there we go hear that we want to make sure that we get down in here along this wood and stuff but yeah you can hear that when you hear that everything is good All right, if that is not a clean one owner, I do not know what is. Let me try and tilt this a little bit. Look at that for an ooh-ah. Now I just have to do the sides, the back, 
and the neck and headstock. Alright, there's the back. We're going to let this glaze over just a little bit, not too much. And we're going to buff that out. Alright, we're working the back over now. Again, we just prepped everything, cleaned everything, and then just French polished over scratches and belt rash and whatever was there. And of course, since we didn't have to do a neck reset, we had all kinds of time for cosmetic finest niceties, niceties of life. Ooh, ah, uh, clean one owner. Completely and utterly disamazing now. I just have to work on the neck and the headstock. I told you, Maury, I told you. Okay, so we have the headstock done, buffed out. And now it's time to put on the tuners, but you always got to check and make sure that they're pointed the right way because those would have been backwards. Of course, the holes will tell you what's going on. And I don't care what they say. I got to use some Chick Flick Teal. And we're going to do a little head ornament here because, yeah, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. Okay, we're getting real close now. It's time for a set of Ernie Ball, Ernesto, Paula, black and silver nylon strings. That model number of this packet is 2406. Now, these are a little bit different than what some of us are used to. You notice there's no bridge pins and we just simply, there's no ball, there's no keeper. You just put that in there like so. We want to make sure that there's enough to go. We're going to wrap these around so they all lock into each other. But we want to make sure that there's plenty down here because we can trim them. There's plenty up top, I guarantee you. But you're going to take this. You're going to go around, you see that? Around, like so. And back through. On some of the smaller strings, we're gonna go around a couple of times. But, now we're gonna tighten that up, like so. Again, if you want, and go around twice but this is going to go to the next one like this and we're going to wrap all these up and now we're going to go up to the top this isn't that exciting and i will see you in a little bit when i'm done with this all right there's our last one around Under, 
over under you know I like steel strings you know that right there we go they're holding guys there's a little Bob log cold motor on whatever this is okay guys in all seriousness the Eggmond guitar from Holland is DUN done and it's time for squirrel friend to go back up on the wall in the wooden shoe and always remember if you ain't Dutch you ain't much son anyway I have enjoyed working on this guitar there wasn't a whole lot to do once I figured out that this plastic cover was there rubberized cover and that I could adjust the neck up and down look at that action I can take it down further I can do whatever I want now this is kind of a clunky guitar um, but it's really well built and in fact it reminds me a lot of this u.s strad guitar which you're going to see show up i've had this one sitting around forever but it's got the same clunky neck u.s strad built by the united states guitar company in new jersey and the person that got this going was frank forcillo who used to work in John D'Angelico's shop in the early days. So you got people building guitars, some build for the very select few, and others decide to use their skill set to build for the masses. But you can see that there are similarities in the stockiness of the neck and all that kind of thing. Again, U.S. Strad, look for this one in a future episode. But what I will tell you about this guitar is number one it's got nylon strings and I put a set of Ernie Ball silver and black strings on it now I'm gonna have to keep a tuner on it for probably 40 years because these strings stretch in very slowly and I'm out in the shed and it's cold this morning warm in the house all that kind of thing but if you need a guitar to put in the cabin or in the room somewhere where everybody's going to sit down once or twice a year and strum around and play around with a guitar this is a good one you can get them relatively cheap especially this model and put a little time into the finish and uh what i found is the tuners are really good quality they're all metal metal except for the bean button tuner knobs but everything else on this guitar is is very solid again it's not a it's not an orchestral instrument but it will I don't think anybody's ever used a slide on something with nylon strings anyway put your time into preserving the wood on a guitar this is a perfect example I just finished over it the way it was put a little bit of Eli Green hoodoo voodoo bead on it and and that little that's actually a cutoff from a souvenir spoon but for the money you can't really beat that shine turned out nice considering where we started okay so we're gonna hang this one up and get back into business on doing something with an arch top so again I've enjoyed this one it's an E-G-M-O-N-D they also make arch tops and I think I'm gonna try to find one of them because that's right necks are adjustable oh forgot to tell you there's a big helical spring all springs are helical but there's a big heavy-duty spring inside of here that is kind of funnel shaped which rides into the groove on the neck which is what moves it up and down mysteriously so 
That said, if you've enjoyed this, give me a like. If you have not enjoyed this, join everybody else. Give me a like anyway. Subscribe if you haven't, and I will see you soon.